Hollywood, California, Monday, July 6th. The Lux Radio Theater presents Lionel Barrymore in the voice of Bugle Ann with Porter Hall and Ann Shirley. Lux presents Hollywood with Lionel Barrymore, Ann Shirley, Hal Roach, Cecil B. DeMille, Ruth Waterbury, and many others. Brought to you by the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, the beauty care used by nine out of ten screen stars and by so many attractive women everywhere. We also salute a distinguished audience. With us tonight, I see Eileen Pringle, Paula Stone, and Cary Grant. Welcome to the Lux Radio Theater. As producer of the Lux Radio Theater, we present one of the most distinguished personages of the entertainment world. Producer of great screen spectacles, creator of stars, his name is known wherever motion pictures are seen. Ladies and gentlemen, Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. The history of the American theater should be read by gaslight, because it was by gaslight that its most colorful chapters were written. A popular song of the day was Two Little Girls in Blue. Horse cars were running on Broadway. Sherry's was the place to eat after the theater. Handsome cabs scurried through Central Park. The fashionable figure was the hourglass silhouette. And Maurice Barrymore, the most popular matinee idol of his day, was making the gay 90s gayer. Among his contributions to the general uproar were three children, Lionel, Ethel, and John. All three turned out to be handsome and extremely versatile artists. But it seems that in everything I've done, Lionel has preceded me. We were the thoroughly unknown sons of famous parents. But when I went on the stage, Lionel was already there. When I started making pictures in 1913, he had been in the movies four years. When the screen switched from talkies, he directed the first all-color talking and singing film, The Rogue Song, starring Lawrence Tibbet. And when I came on the air, he was already so well identified with radio that people were calling him Mike. But at last, I have Lionel exactly where I want him, in a DeMille production. The production is The Voice of Bugle Land by McKinley Cantor. And here is our star, Lionel Barrymore. The chief sport of Missouri farmers is fox hunting. Night after night, they gather in groups and let their hounds loose on the trail. Far or near, they know each hound's voice. They know when the scent is hot and when the fox has doubled on its trail. They sit by friendly fires before and after the chase. There's such a fire burning now. And toiling toward it through heavy underbrush, we see the shadowy figures of Spring Davis a grizzled old farmer, played by Lionel Barrymore, and his son, Benji. Can I help you, Paul? No, 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 I don't need no help. You just take care of yourself, son. I can hear the hounds coming this way. At the fire right up there? Yeah. <laughs> I can see old Calhoun Royster standing up by it and bake. And some <laughs> other fellow. Who's that? You spring? Yeah, me and Benji. Well, come on. You're missing the whole thing. Well, I got here as fast as we could, Cal. What held you? That Molly Pitcher hound of mine. She's going to have a litter. Evening, Bake. Evening, Mr. Davis. Evening, Benji. Evening. Spring, this here gentleman over here is Mr. Tanner. He's from the city. Sells in showing. Evening. How do you do? Come up to listen to the hounds? Why, yes. Mr. Royster, uh, Cal here, was talking so much about it this afternoon, I asked if I might come along. Oh, glad to have you. Uh, it is my son, Benji. How do you do? Evil. Throw another log on the fire, Big. Pretty near to going out. <laughs> listen. They're over the ridge of Heaven Creek now. The hounds are gaining. Well, how can you tell that? 
Oh, it's in their voices. You can tell just what's happening if you listen to them. Yes, but just where is the sport? I've heard of riding to hounds, and I can appreciate that, but this... Well, well we don't ride no horses or wear funny caps, Mr. Tanner. We just raise hounds and train them for the hunt. Well, I should think there wouldn't be any foxes left in this part of the country, killing so many. Oh, we never kill the fox. No, no, no. He, he holds up when he gets tired and the hounds come home. Do you mean the fox will run again another night? Don't they ever learn anything from experience? <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir, they learn. <laughs> and they run again night after night, year after year. Yes, sir, year after year. And do you do this all night and every night? Oh, not every night, no. <laughs> sometimes it rains. Or sometimes it's just the opposite. Sometimes the weather's too dry. Well, sometimes we get long, damp spells. Yeah, too damp. <laughs> no, Mr. Tanner, we don't come out every night, but Cal and me ain't missed many good nights the last 50 years. Well, considering how it's pretty damp out here, it might be a good idea to take out some health insurance. Huh? Huh? Quiet. Oh. Coming on to rain, Spring. Yeah, no hunting tomorrow night. Now, look here, about that insurance, I... What? Someone is coming up the hill, Paul. Spring. Oh, Spring. It's, it's Mother, Paul. What's ailing, Ma? You better come home, Pa. Molly Pitch is restless and nervous. She ain't acting right. Well, I guess her litter's about due. She crying? No, just restless. Well, I'll go. You stay here, Benji, till the fox is hold, and you bring the pack home. All right, Pa. Come along, Ma. We'll head for the house. Well, Paul. I guess it ain't no use. Yes, she dead. Yeah. Molly was, uh, well, she was always a timid little thing, and the lightning and thunder and being a mother was just too much. I guess so, Spring. Too bad. Yeah, too bad. How's the litter? Well, here they are. Five of them. Let me see. <laughs> Cute, ain't they? Yeah. But they demand a pretty big price sometimes for coming into this here world. Uh, which ain't saying nothing about the trouble of raising them on a bottle. Well, it ain't as though I hadn't done it before. Look at that mare. <laughs> She's a mouse run spring. No strength at all. Best let her die, I'm thinking. Oh, no, no, Ma, I wouldn't do that. After all, Molly sort of give her life for this one. <laughs> Last of the litter. Not much to look at. No, she ain't. But but that white blaze on her forehead there, that's kind of pretty, don't you think? Mm -hmm. You see the way it comes around the year there? <laughs> all right, all right, now you'll be getting something to eat in a minute or two. <laughs> you know, Ma, I, I kind of took to this one. I think I'll name her Anne, after a great, great grandmother, Lady Anne. Oh, that was a beautiful voice, Ma. You remember Lady Anne? <laughs> well, maybe this one will have a beautiful voice, too. Put another stick on the fire, babe. I'm near Alder. There she is. Listen, Carol, <laughs> there never has been a sound like that in Heaven Creek County till that little pup come along. Well, it's the strangest sound I ever heard. <laughs> well, that's why I asked you to come here tonight, Mr. Tanner. This is a first hunt. You were here the night she was born. <laughs> that makes me kind of feel like her uncle. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Just about a year ago it was. I called her Lady Anne then. Lady Anne, that is, till I hear the voice, the sweetest voice in the world, clear and soft like a bugle. And you renamed her. Yeah, yeah, she's Bugle Anne now. Bugle Anne. There she is again, Paul. Head in the pack. There never has been a tune like that in any throat in Missouri. And there won't be any more like her when she's gone. Frank, you are just plumb foolish over that animal. Well, why wouldn't it be? I uh, waited a long time to have a hound like that. Yes, sir. Well, I should think it'd be worth it. You, well, you see, sir, it's a matter of breeding good hounds and understanding them and kind of, well, being fond of them. Yeah, they're turn. Yeah. Swinging up past old Camden Place. Yeah, I hear someone's moved into the old house. I ain't here. No, I have, and I've been meaning to speak about it. 
Yeah, Bait? It's some of the Camdens that's moving in up there. They're coming back home. The Camdens was great hound people in their day. That's 20, 30 years ago. Yeah, but this is the son-in-law of the old Camdens, and his name's Terry. And he aims to raise sheep. Sheep? Well, that means a fence. Hmm. Sarah Lance's pa was at the lumber yard, and this fella Terry was there. He was ordering posts and wire. Wire? What kind of wire? Wolf wire. Hogtied, bullstrong, and horse high. I remember this Jacob Terry. Sure enough. Uh, he, he married Effie Camden. I, I hear she died up in Jackson County, leaving one daughter. It seems to me the daughter's first name was Camden. Well, I wouldn't call this Jacob Terry a pleasant man. Yet he once whipped a horse with a hunk of hickory. Oh, well, you can't condemn a man on what you hear. Any man can be reasoned with. Maybe we can reason with him about this fence. Why do you object to Terry having a fence, Mr. Davis? Well, in the first place, a fox hates such a fence. See? He's liable to shy off and leave the country because of it. But but some foxes do like it, and that's even worse. (laughs) Because a hound runs about 15 miles an hour, and he he hits a wove wire fence in the dark. Now, the fox is little. He, he, he's got through without choking to death with the hound. He's likely to get hurt. Well, you can't get good hunting and cutlers where they put fences across the fox range. No, oh, I reckon we better make a visit on this here Jake Terry tomorrow. Nobody's ever put up such a fence in these parts. There's Bugle and again. They've hold. I guess we better call her back, Paul. Yeah, yeah. hand me my horn, Benji. A bugle? Will she come for that? Yes, <laughs> And there's nobody in the world got leave to call Bugle Ann except me. Camden, where are you? Here, Father, getting some water at the pump. Well, hurry up about it. There's a lot of work to be done around the house this morning. Yes, Father. And I want you to help me with that fence. Father, I was going to speak to you about that. Must you put up a fence? Why shouldn't I? Well, the people around here do a lot of hunting. I know it. I heard them all last night. There'll be no hounds running over my property. We're going to raise sheep. I love the sound of hounds. It's really beautiful. Rubbish. I can't stand the sound of them. The sight of them. Well, the fools that make a fuss over them. Oh, but it's just a game, Father. Well, I've often heard Mother tell how they used to sit around the bonfire at night, right out there on the ridge. Uh, it's in your blood, too, I guess. Her mother was more interested in dogs than she was in me. Uh, you're her daughter, all right. Please, Father, let's not quarrel. Oh, get on with your work. I've got better things to do than argue with you. Good morning. You're Miss Camden, I reckon? Yes. Well, I'm Springfield Davis. This, this is my son, Benji, and this is Cal and Bake Royster. How do you do, do? sir? We are neighbors, Miss Camden. We'd like a word with your father. Well, what is it about? Well, it's just that we wanted to discuss a little matter with him. Oh. Uh, Who are all these people, Camden? They want to speak to you, Father. What do you want? Uh, Mr. Terry, we heard you was going to put up a wove wire fence around your land. Well? Well, uh, a hound can't get through that kind of a fence, Mr. Terry. It's sure to get hurt. They get hurt, it'll be their own fault. I'm going to build a fence, hog tight, boot strong, and horse high to keep hounds out. Father, please. Be quiet. Now, nobody has ever put up such a fence in these parts. Well, mine will be the first, then. And if any hounds do happen to get through, I'll shoot them down. Well, now, I reckon nobody who was married to a Camden had heard a hound. I'll do what I like. It's my property. Father, don't. I told you to keep quiet. Now, you pick up that bucket and take it into the house. Yes, Father. Well, let me help you, Miss Camden. You don't need your help. But I... You put down that bucket. I'm only trying to help. You heard what I said, Joe. Don't say it. Put it down, Benji. We're going now. Yeah. The sooner you get out, the better. And there's something else you better understand before you clear off. A hound ain't the only thing that's going to get hurt if it comes sneaking around my property. There ain't nobody going to get hurt, Mr. Terry. Unless you say so. You're in the Lux Radio Theater on Hollywood Boulevard. Our play, The Voice of Bugle Ann. Our star, Lionel Barrymore. We shall resume the play in just a moment. 
Now we take you on a quick tour of Hollywood. Sightseeing buses do a tremendous business here in the world's great movie capital. Picture yourself on one of these buses now going down Hollywood Boulevard. Don't miss anything. Here's the tour conductor. On out of Hollywood Boulevard and Vine, ladies and gentlemen, most famous intersection in Hollywood. A few doors to your right, down Vine Street, the popular Brown Derby restaurant. Now, straight ahead, on your right, the Lux Radio Theater, the most famous radio theater in the world. Well, will you look at the Lux Radio Theater? Why, you know, I always thought it was an imaginary place. Oh, ma'am, it's real. Mother, I knew that. It's the place those wonderful Lux plays are broadcast from. Remember? After I heard the first one, I began to use that Lux toilet soap. Yes, I do remember now. Seems to me your complexion looks much nicer since you started using it. Well, if you can believe Bill, it does. <laughs> he says my complexion's elegant. Now we are turning into Gower Street, ladies and gentlemen. We see the home of the famous RKO Radio Studios. And as we turn around Melrose, we'll Too bad our bus can't stop. We'd be proud to take you inside those famous studios. For we could show you Lux toilet soap in every dressing room. Kept there because RKO Radio girls and famous RKO Radio stars like Irene Dunn and Ginger Rogers prefer this gentle soap. Just like you, they want to keep their skin lovely, free from dullness, tiny blemishes, and enlarging pores that mean cosmetic skin. Lux Toilet Soap guards against this danger because its active lather removes dust and dirt, stale rouge and powder thoroughly. We know you'll like the way Lux Toilet Soap keeps your skin. Try it. Now we return you to Cecil B. DeMille. We continue with the voice of Bugle Land, starring Lionel Barrymore. It's several weeks later. Benji and Camden have been seeing each other almost every night. They stand together now by the rail of a rustic bridge, gazing into the stream below. It's beautiful, isn't it, Benji? Yes, it is. But I guess you trying to make it more beautiful, Candy. That's nice to hear. It sure isn't hard to say. Your pa's hunting tonight. Hmm. Wind is changing, too. The scent will be fairly free, I guess. <laughs> you talk like an old-timer, Camden. It must be in the blood. I guess it is. You know, I lay awake nights listening to the dogs. Oh, I've got so I know their voices. When I hear Bugle Ann... I just go cold all over. Well, she has the sweetest mouth that ever was in Missouri. In the world, Benji. I wish you could make your father feel that way. Oh, I guess he really does deep down. I'm sorry he doesn't treat you better, Benji, so you could come right up to the house to see me. I don't like you sneaking around behind his back. Well, I, I got to see you somehow. Oh, you've done your best, Benji. Oh, you know, it isn't that father's mean, really. He's just unhappy. Well, I'm, I'm sorry you are, Cameron. Not when I'm with you. Camden, honey, what are we going to do? I don't know, Benji. It's, it's awful this way. It's all so, so hopeless. I know. Listen. They're heading over toward your place. I hope they have sense enough to keep away from that wire fence. Oh, Benji, if they ever ran into it. I, I think I better go find Paul. If Bugle Ann ever gets hurt, he, well, he won't be responsible for anything. Benji, I'm worried. Well, I'll be all right. Come on. You can drive me back to the car in your place. I'll walk on from there. Benji, you won't let there be any trouble, will you? Not if I can help it, honey. I don't want anything else to, to come between us. Oh, Benji. Darling. Thanks, Camden. I'll see you tomorrow. Wait, Benji. Well, what is it? Look over there by the fence. Those men. It's Paul. Something's happened. Come on. I'm telling you once and for all, Spring Davis, get out of my pasture and get out now. You can put that gun down, Mr. Terry. Don't scare us at all. I come in here after my hound. Well, it ain't here. If 
if it was, it's got no business among my sheep. It's bugle land. She wouldn't hurt nothing. But she's so small, she could come through your fence when a fox brings her here. Yeah? Well, get this straight, old boy. I'm going to raise sheep, and I don't care a hang for all the hounds in Missouri. Now, you keep yours off my land, or they'll get a dose of number 10 shot in the hind end. Well, what's the matter, Paul? Something's happened to Bugle Ann. I can't find her. You can get out of here, too, Benji Davis. There's more than just hounds give me a peeve, and you know what I mean. If you're talking about candy, Mr. Terry, I, I am. And if you know what's good for you, you'll stay away from her. Listen! Listen to that. It's Bugle Ann. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Mr. Terry? I'm glad for both of us that Bugle Land's out there running safe and sound. It's a good thing for you she's out there and not in here. Foxhounds and Davises, they're all the same breed. And I'll kill any cur that steps on this grass. Jake Terry, if you shoot a Davis hound, I'll blow you clean to glory. Come on, Benji, pal. Better round up the pack, friend. Getting kind of late to be out. Uh, good for nothing, rigid runners. Father. What do you want? It isn't all their fault. They were trespassing on my property. I know, but, Father, you could put up a fence that would keep your sheep in and not hurt their dogs. Oh, you're siding with them. No. No, Father, I'm not. Your mother always sided against me with her people. Oh, but you're so unreasonable. Those folks don't want any trouble. Why, they'd like to be friendly with you. Oh, I see. So they're already your friends. Sometimes I don't understand you, Father. Where were you tonight? I was out in the car. You said you were going to a picture show. I, I changed my mind. It was so warm. You lied to me. You just wanted to lollygag with a no-account lazy pup who... Stop it! I won't let you talk that way about Benji Davis. I said I didn't want you to see any more of him. Oh, listen, Father. Didn't you ever love Mother a little? Even in the beginning... Don't when... try to get around me. I told you to stay away from him. You've got no right to say it. I've got to see Benji. You'll not lie to me again or disobey. I love him. And what you say or do won't make... <sighs> Oh, maybe oh. that'll make some difference. That's the last time you'll ever strike me, Father. It ain't the first and ain't the last. You'll do as I say. I'm leaving you, Father. I'm leaving you tonight. Where are you going, Paul? To call on Jake Terry. But that gun, he ain't going to take a gun, Spring. Bugland can't be dead. You hear to yourself up by Terry's pasture. That was earlier, Ma. I called her all last night, but she didn't come to me. You think, you think Terry shot her? I ain't sure, Ma, but me and Cal and Benji is going up that way this morning to look for her. And if she's there... Oh, Spring, I wish you wouldn't. Oh, you just leave this to me. I know what I'm doing. Don't see any sign of a spring. Well, she isn't here, that's sure. Pa, come on, let's go home. She ain't here, but she might be buried here. Why, what do you mean, Pa? You remember, Cal, how Bugle Ann caught her foot in that rat trap before she was weaned? Sure, sure. Everybody knows that. But one gone toe never bothered her. Her track was always plain, Cal. I've been looking for her track up here, and there it is. Oh. Right there in the mud. You see it, Cal? Plain as daylight. Uh -huh. I reckon it'd stand in cold just like fingerprints and such. She passed here on her way home, and Jake Terry shot her. Wait, wait, Paul. Get out of my way, son. Come back here, Paul. I want to see Jake Terry. Wait, oh, you, you don't know what you're doing. Let me go. He killed Bugle Land. But, but you can't act hasty, Paul. Hasty? If I'm looking for rats in my granary, I don't sit down and wait for them. Give me that gun, Spring. Let go. You never bred Bugle Land, did you? He was mine. There's Terry on the porch. He's got a gun, too, Spring. I told you to stay off my place, Spring Davis. What did you do with it, Terry? What did you do with Bugle Land? Get out of here, you old devil. You better answer me. I ain't never killed your dirty hound, but I'll put some slugs into you if you don't get out of here. Look out, Paul. Oh, you hit it. I reckon it did. Look, 
Miss Terry, you are under oath to tell the truth. You know that. Yes, sir. Then please tell the jury just why the defendant objected to your father building a fence. Because it interfered with his fox hunting. Where were you on the evening preceding your father's death? I was out riding with, with Benji Davis. When you returned to your house, what happened? We saw men by the side of the house. Spring Davis and Calhoun Royster. Yes. And Spring Davis quarreled with your father, didn't he? Miss Terry. Yes. And after they left? I, I tried to speak to father. We had an argument. And then? He slapped me. Struck you? Just once, not very hard. What was the argument about, Miss Terry? About Benji. He objected to your going out with him. Yes. And the argument was not about dogs. Well, that's what started it, and I was... What happened then? I packed my clothes and took the car. It was my car, and he didn't stop me because he knew my Aunt Nancy had given it to me after Uncle Newt died. Go on. Well, I was angry. I didn't want to stay there. I drove away. Where? To my Uncle El Nathan's place, up north. It was two days before I heard of my father's death. Miss Terry, are you still friendly with the defendant's son? We haven't seen each other, if that's what you mean. Since... One more question, Miss Terry. Did your father kill the defendant's dog? I left. I wasn't there. That's all, Miss Terry. Now, Mr. Davis, tell me this. You never found the body of the dog, did you? No, sir, we never found her. And it's true that you and your friends, after the killing, made an intensive search of the premises for it. Well, we knew she'd been there. I couldn't mistake her footprint because she was one toe shy. Never mind that. You went over Mr. Terry's fence and into his yard armed, didn't you? That's correct. You were prepared to kill. I object, Your Honor. Objection overruled. Answer the question, Mr. Davis. I told Jake Terry if he harmed Bugle Ann, there'd be trouble. Do you mean to tell me you were prepared to kill a man because of a dog? Oh, now, wait a minute. <laughs> I guess you never owned a house. Answer my question. Well, I am answering it. <laughs> it kind of answers itself. To anybody that ever owned a hound and loved it the way I did Bugle Ann... <laughs> It wasn't because Bugle Ann had the sweetest mouth in the world. And it wasn't because I raised her from a pup and bred her to the horn. If, it, if she didn't have no more voice than a frog, I'd have felt the same way about her or, or any other hound of mine. Jake, you, you may remember what Senator Vest said about a dog. I reckon you do. He was a lawyer and... He said what he had to say in court, same as I'm talking. <laughs> he could talk a whole lot better than I can. What he said was this. The best friend a man has in this world may turn again him. His son or his daughter that he's reared the best way he knows how may turn again him. The people who hurrah and cheer when everything's going good will be the first ones to heave a rock at him when he's down. The one absolutely unselfish friend that a man can have. The one that never deserts him, the one that never proves ungrateful or treacherous, is his dog. Yes, sir. A man's dog stands by him, rich or poor, sick or well. He'll sleep on the cold ground with the wind blowing and the snow driving. It don't make no difference to him so long as he's there by his master's side. He'll kiss the hand and ain't got no food to give him. He'll guard the sleep of a pauper as if he was a king. And when all other friends desert, he sticks. He, if fortune drives the master and then an outcast into the world, friendless and homeless, the faithful dog don't ask nothing more than, than just to be with him and, and guard him against any danger that he can. And when the last scene of all comes and he's laid away in the cold ground, no matter if all his other friends go on their way, there by his grave you'll find the dog. His head between his paws, 
And his eyes, sad but open and watching, faithful and true right down to the very end. <laughs> yes, sir. Oh, I seen it more than once. I'd kill a man if he killed a friend of mine without no reason. And a hound is as much a friend as any man, except he ain't got none of a man's fault. Yes, sir. I ain't denying I killed Jake Terry, cause he killed Bugle Ann. I didn't want to do it, Judge. I just had to. <laughs> The jury considered its verdict? We have. We find the defendant guilty of murder. Sit down, Cal. Sit down. <laughs> These cells ain't much to look at. I, I guess the best they can do. <laughs> Here they're going to give me my sentence this morning. That's why I come, Spring. Yeah. Well, now, there's no use grieving about it, Cal. <laughs> Reckon there's nothing else the jury could do, seeing as I killed him and didn't deny it, no how. Oh, they might have taken into account how you was provoked. He killed Bugle Ann, didn't he? Yeah. And he would have killed you, too, if you yeah. hadn't have given him the death shot first. Yes, that's why. Well, now, don't worry about me, Cal. It ain't going to be so bad up there in Jeff City. <laughs> A lot of men stand it, and they ain't no tougher than me. <laughs> I'm sorry for Ma and Benji, though. You, you'll do what you can for him, Cal. You know I will, Spring. To tell Benji that Camden's really a fine girl, and I, I hope maybe someday it'll work out for him. It's much worse for them two young ones than it is for me. You know, Cal, I ain't done much reading lately, and this will give me a sort of chance to catch up. <laughs> oh, I'll send you the Red Ranger and the Hunter's Horns, Reed. Oh, now that's mighty fine of you, Cal. Spring, I... I oh, I, now, I, sure. Don't feel bad, Cal. It's all right. It ain't nothing. I'm kind of looking forward to the chance of getting myself in good physical shape again. <laughs> I hear they got a lot of exercise up there. I reckon I've been setting out in the wet too much nights. I guess I won't be setting out nights up there much. <laughs> All right, Davis. They want you in the courtroom. Yes, sir. Say, Cal, I, I'm kind of nervous about this. You know, I never was sentenced before. You go ahead, Cal, and tell Mo and Benji not to take it too hard. Goodbye, Spring. Goodbye. I'll do the best I can. Yes. Yes, well, I... Spring Davis? Yes, sir. The jury has heard the evidence presented in this court, and they have found you guilty. The court hereby sentences you to the state prison for a period of 20 years for the crime of which you've just been convicted. Spring. No, no, no. It's all right, Ma. Don't carry on now. But 20 years. It ain't right, no, Spring. No, no, Ma. No. I'm awful sorry to bring this trouble on you, Ma. I'm awful sorry, Ma. We pause for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is Cecil B. DeMille speaking to you from the Lux Radio Theater in Hollywood. Lionel Barrymore and Anne Shirley return shortly for the third act of The Voice of Bugle Ann. Line for line, more news is printed about Hollywood than any other community in the world. Affairs of state are taken off the front page to make way for Shirley Temple's newest tooth or Greta Garbo's search for solitude. And magazines make public the private lives of our stars. Millions of people see Hollywood through the eyes of a certain editor who has left her 
editorial uneasy chair, to come to the Lux Radio Theater tonight. The editor of Photoplay Magazine, Miss Ruth Waterbury. Thank you, Mr. DeMille. You know, when an editor interviews a director, that's not news. But when a director interviews an editor... That's a radio program. Uh, Miss Waterbury, I have a protest to file on behalf of the gentlemen of the screen. Why aren't more pictures of male stars used on magazine covers? The answer's simple. When we have a beautiful girl on the outside of our magazine, many people buy it just for the picture. But when we have a man's picture on the cover, no soap. Uh, don't say no soap. This is the Lux Radio Theater. <laughs> what I mean is, we have to have women's pictures because the majority of our readers are women. Then, then why not men's pictures? Aren't most women uh, Gable Gapers and Coleman Cravers? <laughs> We've had men on covers and eaten magazines for months thereafter. Women, by all newsstand records, are primarily interested in women. They want to know new ways to fix their hair, whether thin or heavy eyebrows are in fashion, how to keep their figures and their complexions lovely. I fancy, for instance, that a great many women use Lux toilet soap because they know screen stars use it. Well, that's no secret here. <laughs> if an actress singles out a product for her personal use, you, you may be sure it's the best. Yes, when the stars take the cake, I mean when the stars take the uh, cake... Uh, oh, uh, Miss Waterbury, just one. Uh, what you're trying to say is, when the stars take the cake, Lux is the cake they take. <laughs> In any event, Hollywood is teaching women the tremendous importance of personal appearance, and it's teaching the world that glamour is not a quality you're necessarily born with. In other words, you, Mr. DeMille, the great glamour creator, know that glamour is just learning how to emphasize one's own personality. This, I believe, is why Hollywood today is dominating the news of the world. It is every woman's inspiration. It is teaching every woman how to emphasize her own best point. Thank you, and good night. Good night, editor. <laughs> And now for the last act of our play, The Voice of Bugle Ann, starring Lionel Barrymore with Anne Shirley. Almost a year has gone by since Spring Davis was condemned to prison. It's late evening, and in the kitchen of the old farmhouse, Benji and Mrs. Davis are sitting tensely in their chairs. They seem to be waiting for something, half expectant, half frightened. Mrs. Davis breaks a long silence. Benji. Yes? Are you going out searching again tonight? We searched and searched. Almost every night for two weeks. She's never answered the horn. I hear her and you hear her. Big hear her, so his paw. It was no mistake. Bugle Ann was bugling that night. She couldn't have been more. Bugle Ann's dead. Terry killed her almost a year ago. I never said she wasn't dead, Benji. But we hear her just the same. Oh, it's, it's unnatural to believe in ghosts. She was leading a pack. I'd have known her voice, Benji. And if she'd been alive, she'd have come when you called her. I guess the pack that she's been leading could, could go through a hog-tight fence like so much dishwater. Because there ain't no fences where they've been. No more. I guess the great hounds have got a place of their own to go to after they run the last race here. Benji, I've been meaning to ask you. Didn't Camden ever write to you nor nothing since since the trial? Huh? Oh. No, she never did, Ma. I ain't never heard a word. You know where she is, don't you? Up with her uncle. No, oh, I know, but oh, what's the use? There can't ever be nothing between Camden and me. Not now. If she loves you, Ben. How can she? My father killed her father. There's a murder between us. Benji. Oh. oh, I'm not saying Paul wasn't right. I'll do the same thing in his place. But that doesn't change things. Nothing can change things. Benji. Shh. There it is again. She's back, Benji. She's come back. Don't say that, Ma. Ma, it isn't possible. Possible or not, Benji. That's the voice of Bugle Ann. I 
What are you doing, Captain? Writing a letter? Why, yes, Uncle L. Nathan. I've been trying to. Don't seem very successful. Got the end of that pen all chewed to bits and hardly lying down. Who is it, too? No one. I, I'm not going to write it after all. Camden, come here. You ain't still thinking on that young Davis fella, are you? Are you? Would it be so terrible? No, not terrible, but, well, it ain't exactly right. Why not? Do I have to answer that for you, Camden? Don't you know why? It wasn't Benji's fault. He did nothing wrong. His father did. And isn't he paying for it? He's up there in state prison. An old man, hurt and beaten, because he did what he thought was right. Camden. I can't help it. I can't help it. All right, Camden. It's all right. Uncle, how do you go about getting a man released from prison? You'd want to do that. He killed your father, Camden. I guess it's the awfulest thing in the world to have hated one's father. I'm sorry I had to hate him, but, but he was mean. I saw what he did to my mother. Uh, come in, Davis. Thank you, sir. Thank you. They tell me you want to see me, Warden. Yes, I suppose you're wondering what it's all about. Well, about the only thing I could figure was maybe I wasn't doing so well as a gardener. Maybe you was sending me to some other prison. No, nothing like that. Mr. Davis, you're free. Free? That's right. But the judge said 20 years, and it's... It's only nigh under four. Here's your pardon from the governor. And I, I can go home? That's it. But, but this has got me kind of stamped. The governor don't know me, and I never had the honor of meeting him. Well, perhaps you've got some influential friends. No, 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 I guess not. At least why it's not that I can remember being on speaking terms with. Well, it all came pretty much as a surprise to me, too, but you can go home. Home. I reckon that'll be kind of nice. Ma and Benji have been writing, but it ain't like having your kinfolk close around now. Here's it, Mr. Hanrahan. All right. I'll telegraph your wife you're coming. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Goodbye, and good luck, Mr. Davis. Thank you, Warden. Thank you. Kick your partners for the day. Swing your partners. <laughs> uh, it's mighty nice of you, Ma, to have all the folks over. Oh, we're so glad to have you home, Pa. <laughs> it's a real celebration. How do I look? Am I all right to go downstairs? Yeah, let me fix your tie. <laughs> there, that's better. <laughs> you can come down anytime you want to now. We'll have dinner whenever you want. Well, son, Pa, uh, I want to speak to you. Now? What about? Well, I close the door. <laughs> pa, I got something I want to show you. What, Benji? Look, Pa. Dog's collar. Bugle and collar. That's right, Paul. Bugle and collar. Where'd you get it? Where is she? Now, now, sit down, Paul. Sit down and be calm. And... You, you, you found bugle and, and you never wrote it to me. Now, now, take it easy, Paul. Where, where was it? Where? Up in Bachelor's Timber. We never found until last September. Bachelor's? No, no. Couldn't have been up there. Yes. She was caught right in that old rusty wire windbreak down near the shack. Caught in the wire? Strangled? Yes. How long she been there? You couldn't tell, Paul. If it hadn't been for the collar, I, I wouldn't have known it was her. Maybe a year she was there. Maybe a lot more. Then Jake Terry never done it. Well, maybe... Maybe Bugle ran run up there after he shot her. 
Or maybe... Oh, stop your foolish talk. Well, that, that ain't the whole story, Paul. There was a time, the first of June, after you went up there, when we heard a bugling in the woods beyond Heaven Creek. She was alive then. Yes. Yeah. But three nights ago, the night we heard you were coming home, we heard her again, Paul. Three nights ago? We heard you glad. There was a time when I'd laughed my head off of that, but I've had plenty of time to think these last four years. There was funny things in the Civil War, boy. My father told me about, and there's been funny things other times. Now, I, I don't say you heard Bugle Ann the other night, but you did hear something. Mighty often, I thought I heard her clear off in Jeff City. Three nights ago, you heard her. Yes. Not since. Well, there's been rain. Well, there ain't no rain tonight. Oh. We listened tonight, Benji. You and me and Cal and, and Bake, like we used to. I'll have my horn along, and if I hear her voice... Paul, Paul, listen. If I hear her voice, I'll call her home. Paul, come here about a fire. That's a beeline fox, all right. <laughs> Don't let no grass grow under his feet. Benji, what is it, Bake? What'll happen if your pa blows that horn he's carrying? Would she come back to answer it? Shh, look out. It's getting sweet, Cal. Yeah, getting sweet. Listen, listen. It's bugle in. It can't be, it can't. It's bugle in. Paul, Paul, listen, it's, it's a hound, an ordinary hound. It belongs to, I reckon it's an Armstrong. No Armstrong ever had that kind of music in him. No for pity's sake, Spring, it's just a kind of an echo. Cal, if she comes real close to us, I'll blow the bugle for her. Paul, Paul, sit down, sit down. <laughs> Are you plumb certain that was her collar, Benji? I reckon nobody but the Lord seen her bones hop up out of the orchard tonight. Now, Spring, you've got to get hold of yourself. Get hold? <laughs> Why, I bred the most beautiful tune ever played in these parts. I ain't ashamed. <laughs> Maybe you laugh when you seen me bring this bugle, but I reckon that it'd come in handy. Bugle Ann will come home, Carol, when she hears this. She'll... What's that? It's someone else. Someone else is blowing her in. I never done it. I never gave no one else leave to blow her in. Well, where'd the call come from? Up on Heaven Ridge, your path. We'll find out where right now. Come on. There it is. Another fire. And there's a hound walking back and forth. That's it? That's the hound? Wait! There's a girl there. She's looking right at us. Sees us, too. Oh, it's... it's Camden. Camden? Come on. Camden. Good evening, Benji. Why, what are you doing here? Was it you blew them notes? Yes, I did. Twice. That hound. What hound is that? I raised it. But it's got her voice. It's got Bugle Ann's voice. Yes, I know. I used to hear her. I tell you, the Lord never made no two hound voices alike. Same kind of mouth and all, he never did. What is it all about, Ken? This hound. She was hers, Benji. She's Bugle Ann's puppy. There were four more, but only this little one had the real bugle mouth. Bugle Ann? She never had no pup. Mr. Davis. My father never killed Bugle Ann. Ah, oh, we know that. The boys found a skeleton over there by bachelors, and they, they heard her voice in the woods. But I still say she never had no puppies. That night, I drove out of the yard just like I told in court. Bugle Ann was coming past the gate. I couldn't see her in time. I couldn't. It was an awful sharp turn, and 
I ran over. I got out and picked her up. She wasn't dead, and she didn't seem to blame me. I was afraid there'd be trouble over her being hurt. Well, where, where did this dog get her voice? I took her up to Uncle Al Nathan's in Jackson County. After we heard what had happened, I didn't dare tell the truth. It would have been worse for you if the jury knew that Bugland wasn't really dead at all. Go on. Please, Cameron. I nursed Bugland back to health. There were five pups, but, oh, this one was like her. What? What happened to Bugland? She waited till they were weaned. Then she left one night. There was a moon. She wasn't strong enough to run, but she did go away. We traced her 15 miles next day, then lost her for good. Likely she was heading for home when she struck a fox and you folks heard her. We never knew she was dead for sure, but we always thought she'd been killed trying to get back home. Benji says he heard her bugling three nights back. That was the dog here. I came out thinking you might be in the timber. You knew they let me out of prison? Why, yes. How'd you know? Well, I just knew that's all. You ain't got prophecy in her second sight? Say, may, maybe you're on speaking terms with the governor. No, I wouldn't call it that. But you had something to do with his pardon? Why, oh, plain as you know. Speak up, child. All my folks weren't carried. There was some Camden. That's right. They might have counted for something when considering a pardon. The Camdens mean something in this state. Why, even yet. Some of them are in the legislature, and the governor listens to them when they, when they want something as much as I wanted you to be free. You did it, didn't you? Oh, I just did what I could. I told them about Mr. Davis. Well, thank you, Miss Camden. Oh, please. <laughs> hey, this little hound here. Hey, she's kind of taken to me, I think. Look at her, sniffing around. Well, I reckon you two youngsters got things to talk over. <laughs> oh, I have. Camden. Not now. But it, it's going to be all right, isn't it? If you want Benji. Sure he does. He's been mooning around ever since you left, his mother tells me. Well... Wait, Mr. Davis. I brought the dog for you. I'd like you to have her. For me? Oh, that's mighty nice of you. I trained it at the horn, just the same as Bugle Ann. Well, what you call her? Little lady. Little lady, huh? <laughs> well, you got quite a mouth, little lady. And spotted just the same as your ma. She's got the same voice. Yeah. And it's going to sound mighty pretty. Coming clear across the hills. Mighty pretty, little lady. Our play, The Voice of Bugle Ann, with Lionel Barrymore as Spring Davis, is ended. But in a moment, you'll hear him again as Lionel Barrymore. When I came to Hollywood in 1913, the first man who asked me for a job was a cowboy extra. I still have the notebook in which I wrote his name, Hal Roach. Beside it is the salary he asked for, $5 a day. And beside that, my notation, too much. I hired others for $3 a day, and thereby did Hal Roach a favor. He went out and started his own studio, making comedies featuring another unknown extra named Harold Lloyd. In time, he started the Our Gang series, and the motion picture industry now awards him the laurel for producing more comedies than anybody else in Hollywood. Wait a minute, C.B. If you're going to mention Laurel, you've got to mention Hardy. <laughs> Mr. Hal Roach, ladies and gentlemen who insists that among his laurels is Hardy and many other great comedians, including B.B. Daniels, whom I stole from him. G.C.B., I'm as nervous tonight as that cowboy who asked you for a job. <laughs> Why nervous? You've graduated from cowboy to polo player. <laughs> Don't blame that on me. It's my horse's fault. Can I help it if he was ambitious? He was more ambitious than some of the horses that run at your Santa Anita racetrack. You've picked many winners for films. 
You've developed the most famous group of youngsters in the world, our gang. But your greatest achievement was changing the custard pie from a harmless dessert to a deadly weapon. But you have developed the most famous character in Hollywood. Which one? The Yes Man. <laughs> Never heard of him. Yes, Mr. DeMille. Uh, wh where do you get your child actors? <clears throat> well, I went through raising those kids. At first, I couldn't get actors for our gang. People didn't want their children in films, and the slogan in Hollywood was, Mothers, hide your children. Here comes Hal Roach. <laughs> but now, after 17 years, the situation's reversed, and the slogan in the studio is, Hide Hal Roach. Here come the mothers. <laughs> now, you, you created a lot of laughter in those years, and millions of people have relived their childhood seeing those comedies on the screen. You're more than a great showman, Hal. You make people laugh and forget their troubles. I can say the same thing for you, C.B. Barnum had the greatest show on earth, but you've got the greatest show on the air. I'll be listening every Monday night. But before leaving, I'd like to answer a question asked by countless of fans. Who is going to play opposite Patsy Kelly since the untimely passing of that great comedian, Thelma Todd? I think her successor is one Thelma would have chosen herself. Lita Roberti. So long. So long, cowboy. Few people know that besides his achievements on the stage, screen, and radio, the star of tonight's production is an etcher, pianist, and composer of distinct ability. Hollywood's most civilized actor, Lionel Barrymore. Well, thanks very much for the bouquet, C.B. There's one flower I left out of it. We all know you're a great actor. But few of us know that you invented one of our most important mechanisms, the movable microphone. <laughs> well, somebody had to do something. You see, ladies and gentlemen, in, in the old talky days, microphones were stationary. Uh, they were concealed in places like book stands and floor lamps. And it was pretty embarrassing for a player to walk over to a vase and say, Darling, I love you. <laughs> So I putted around with a few wires and screws and, and... gave us an instrument which follows the player and picks up every word naturally. I hope you remember to patent it. You know, Edison forgot to patent all the rights of the motion picture machine. <laughs> that little oversight cost him many millions. But if it hadn't been for that invention, I wonder where you and I'd be right now. Well, you'd probably be writing and directing plays, and I might be a commercial artist. I remember you once deserted the footlights and turned painter, but the paint didn't stick. Now, you're an actor and the son of an actor. <laughs> I guess so. Blood must be thicker than watercolors. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking forward to seeing your portrayal of Andrew Jackson in our next picture, in your next picture, The Gorgeous Hussy. It's going to be quite a change to see you without whiskers. Well, I've been wearing beards and mustaches so long I'd almost forgotten how I looked myself. <laughs> it's a real relief to be able to wash my face again. With Lux, I hope. Lux? Why, well, you can't turn around in Hollywood without running into that soap. In one picture, I I'm Norma Shearer's father, and she uses it. And then in I'm some other girl's uncle, and she uses it. And now I come over here, and there's a broadcast about it. Even Anne Shirley, who played in tonight's show, uses it. I certainly do, Mr. Barrymore. My complexion is no better friend than Lux toilet soap. You see? That's all I hear. Luck, luck, luck. And why do you listen? Well, because I like it, too. Good night. <laughs> Good night. Good night, Mr. Barrymore and Miss Shirley, and many thanks. Mr. Barrymore appeared through courtesy of Metro-Golden-Mayer, and Shirley, RKO, Louis Silvers, 20th Century Fox, and Cecil B. DeMille and Porter Hall, Paramount. And here is Mr. DeMille with word of next week's play. Next Monday night, the Lux Radio Theater stars Marion Davies and Joel McRae in the story of a tempestuous waif, the Brat. It's an exceptional entertainment we've chosen for you with one of Hollywood's brightest stars in one of Broadway's most brilliant successes. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.